All right, guys, uh, welcome to my show this weekend. I've now gone to South Africa, and that is why I'm talking like this. And what's happened is I woke up today, and I see that Jordan Peterson has gone and appeared on the Lex Friedman podcast, uh, Rot. and uh, Jordan Peterson is... A guy who I criticize a lot. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of strange things happening with Jordan Peterson. He, you know, he he makes a lot of bizarre claims and engages in a lot of bizarre behaviors. And so, and Lex Friedman is a, a strange guy as well. He, you know, Lex Friedman is a guru and uh, he's sort of like a techno monk. And so. The combination of Lex Friedman with Professor Jordan B. Peterson is a very strange one. And I was thinking maybe I would offer my thoughts as a critic as a critic of uh, Jordan Peterson. And so that is what I'm going to be doing today, guys. Okay. Can I even go back to my normal voice? So it's unfortunately three hours long which I just find that found out when um, when I went on it. Three hours, you know. Okay, first, let's... Oh, Jesus. Uh, let's take a glance at the top end. <laughs> Dostoevsky. I mean, some of these it, as well, it's kind of... I, I mean, and, and, come on, it's not as if Peterson is a Dostoevsky scholar or something. He's just some guy who's read Dostoevsky and imposed his um his sort of psychology his understanding of psychology and his con personal concerns into the text there but there we go and i guess lex will like that because lex is you know a bit russian or whatever god science just science in general death so these are all things that peterson is of course highly qualified to talk about elon musk Global crisis, dangerous ideologies. Oh, the irony! Justin Trudeau. Oh, that was that was horrible. Apologies. War in Ukraine. Oh, Jesus! How to think? Fucking hell! If there's two people you don't want to be taking advice from. Um, advice for young people. Once more, I mean, look. Not everyone. Obviously, not everyone can do the things that these guys have done, and they've both been very, very lucky, right? As well. And I don't know that they're quite the people to be taking it but anyway and then russian literature so it all sort of wraps background and then the meaning of life okay let's do the thing i'm gonna i'm gonna put it on 1.5 into the sky. monsters lest you become a monster yeah. and if you gaze into the abyss the abyss gazes also into you right but i would say bring it on if you <laughs> gaze into the abyss long enough you see the light not the darkness are you sure about that i'm betting my life on it following i mean look quotes like that that nietzsche quote right of if you stare back into the abyss the abyss stares back into you they're things that sort of you know they sound profound or whatever but really it is not clear that that's like some law of reality or something i mean what does it even mean to stare into the abyss right does it mean just to stare into the night sky to reflect on the nature of life or something it, 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 that's not clear in the first place um, and then obviously there's a metaphor going on of it will stare back into you, right? Which, which could mean a lot of things. And so I just, I just don't know that actually 
so, you know, really being really serious and investigating what quotes like that are supposed to mean is actually a useful thing to do. Because I mean, what what really stands either way of your interpretation of a quote like that? I mean, it's not it's not going to do anything. You're still going to have to go to the grocery store this weekend and buy a bunch of food, right? And um, clean the lime scale out of your toilet. So, I mean, I mean, how is that quote really going to help you or have any import for your life? It 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 seems like that it, there's almost like this performance drama, right? Of like we're doing a very serious thing right now. Um, that goes along with, and I'm sit, like we're, we're intensely staring at each other while talking about the abyss staring into your soul or whatever. Conversation with Jordan Peterson, an influential psychologist, lecturer, podcast host, and author of Maps of Meaning, 12 Rules for Life, and Beyond Order. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Jordan Peterson. Dostoevsky wrote in The Idiot, spoken through the character of Prince Mishkin, that beauty will save the world. Solzhenitsyn actually mentioned this in his uh, Nobel Prize mm -hmm. acceptance speech. What do you think uh, Dostoevsky meant by that? Was he right? Well, I guess it's the divine that saves. Keep in mind, I'm playing this at 1.5 speed. So um, if people sound silly because they're talking fast or if there are long pauses, remember those pauses are one and a half times longer <laughs> at the normal speed. The world, let's say, you could say that by definition. And then you might say, well, are there pointers to that which will save the world or that which eternally saves the world? And the answer to that in all likelihood is yes. And that's maybe truth and- In all likelihood. What does it, what does it mean in all likelihood? Like how, how is he performing a likelihood assessment there? You know, like he just sort of says things, but it's not really clear what he actually means by them or what, what, what support there is for those claims. Love and justice and the sounds, classical virtues, sounds good beauty. Though perhaps in some sense, foremost among them. It's a, that's a difficult case to make, but definitely a pointer. Which direction is the arrow pointing? Well, the arrow is pointing up. No, I think that oh. that which it points to is what beauty points to. It transcends beauty. It's more than beauty. And that speaks to the divine. It points to the divine. Yeah, and I would say again, by definition, because we could define the divine in some way. It points to the divine by definition. Well, yeah, if, <laughs> if you define it that way, right? So, you know, it's kind of like, if I define religion as just, whatever anyone does well then everyone's religious if i define belief in god as um doing anything then everyone believes in god it's just whatever they do the most or something and you can sort of do that with the divine right you can be like whatever people like is the divine and you know you can sort of perform the ultimate question beg in that sense by just telling everyone that really they believe in the divine. So you can be like, look, Matt Dillahunty and Tom Jump and all these other people, you really believe in the divine when you engage in your debates because that's what you like to do the most, something. Um, but that's obviously very uncharitable because they wouldn't self-report as believing in the divine when they do that. That's just Peterson's uh, interpretation of what's going on. And whether or not that is what's actually happening is precisely the um the claim at issue when someone who's an atheist debates with peterson the claim at issue is whether that is in fact the correct way of understanding reality whether that is the way that reality in fact is um and i you know i tend to think it's not because well i mean we can talk about the specifics this might be a bit of a, a bit of a tangent but like when when one claims that something that's beautiful points to the divine right what does it actually mean for it to point to the divine so so presumably there's there's the ordinary there's a realm of, of entities that consist of the ordinary and there's a realm of entities that consist of the divine so you've already got this additional realm of entities right over a naturalistic explanation so it's less parsimonious but now you have to describe what this relationship of pointing to is right and how and how it's achieved and what it what it means and I, I just don't understand i mean look you can always say that's because you're an idiot nathan right that's why you don't understand but um i at least don't think i'm an idiot and i just don't understand what this pointing to relation is it's just it's just very vague and hand wavy and it's something that kind of it, you know it sounds like there's a lot being said right to just say th this beautiful thing points to the divine but <sighs> 
I think really what's going on there is just there's a, there's a collection of, of emotions and feelings which are clustered together and Peterson's just kind of like reporting them all. So maybe the divine, right, is that is actually a, a sort of emotional experience. And then, I don't know, when he experiences, sees religious art or something, he also has a similar feeling, I'm guessing. No sense. So one way of defining the divine is what is divine to you is your most fundamental axiom. And you might say, well, I don't have see, a... See what I was just saying before, right? Your most fundamental axiom. And, and, and this idea of axioms is, you know, he's he's using it in a different sense to how axiom is really meant. Because it's not as though people have belief systems where they just assume some small set of propositions and then prove everything else they believe from those propositions. So, you know, by axiom here, he just means what's the most important belief you have. He doesn't actually mean axiom in any in any kind of proof theoretical sense or something. But um, and, and, and this is something I object to, right, because he uses a lot of these sorts of metaphors in order to make what he's doing in offering his theory sound like he, what he's in fact doing is offering you something scientific right something that's similar to what a mathematician does or something that's similar to what a scientist does he's doing no such thing he's just he's just using words that sound technical um incorrectly in order to kind of but, but so so what he means is whatever's most important to you is um a religious commitment but then that that's not what i think i think that that is false so if we have a discussion, he can tell me that that's true, but I'm going to tell him that that's wrong. And it's ro it's definitely wrong for me, even if it's true for him, right? If he considers what's most important for him to be a religious commitment. And then we can just discuss, well, which of these theories is in fact better, right? The theory where whatever's most important to anyone is in fact a religious commitment, or my theory where, um, you know, a small subset of people's commitments are religious commitments, namely those associated to God's um and uh, and divine realms of entities whereas those commitments which are not associated you know perhaps perhaps what's most important to me is just fucking people right like that if, if that if that's true that's got nothing to do with the divine according to me um but it does according to peterson right he's going to say you've made it into your god or whatever which he can do, but I think that's just wrong, right? It's just, it, it, it's, it's really poorly motivated and it's just to ascribe, ascribe to, there's something fundamentally quite wrong about ascribing motivations um, and beliefs to a person that they just wouldn't self-report themselves. Like, here's what's really going on. And then there's no, you know, and then there's no way of falsifying it, right? Because if they, you know, if they say, well, no, it's not, you're like, well, you're just in denial, right? Because you've got that there's these subconscious, there's a subconscious realm of beliefs and and things. <laughs> um, so I, I just take issue with with this. And I, I hate it when um, Peterson fans and religious people do this. They just they just question back by telling people what it is that they in fact believe is religious. A fundamental axiom. And I would say that's fine. But then you're just confused because you have a bunch of contradictory axioms. And you might say, well, I have no axioms at all. And then I'd say, well, you're just epistemologically ignorant beyond comprehension if you think... Oh, fuck you. Like, I think you're epistemologically ignorant beyond comprehension, right? Like, that is genuinely what I think. I think you're hopelessly, profoundly confused when it comes to philosophy. Um, and so I genuinely think that you're ignorant beyond comprehension. It's like, why does he talk like this? I'm So I'm I'm saying this in response to, to him speaking to his interlocutor who hypothetically disagrees with him. Now, in reality, I'm an interlocutor who disagrees with him, right? And this is what he genuinely thinks about people who disagree with him. So I think it's fair enough for me to like, just respond tip for tap with what he's saying. <sighs> but it's just so, it's, there's something so ridiculous about someone being so ill-informed, um, so confused, right? And then being the one to tell other people that they're that they're profoundly um, uninformed and confused. Like Peterson has absolutely no idea about the 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 landscape of epistemological views of what goes on. Like my views, right, were broadly going to be conceived as like a hinge epistemology. I bet he doesn't know what that is. I bet he and it's not like it's not like someone has to know what that is or they're an idiot. But it's just that he's clearly not involved in the debate whatsoever. He's clearly not well read on the on the topic. He's not he's not informed. He's not. Um, and then he's just making these these bizarre assertions using metaphors like axioms, which are misleading. 
Um, yeah, like you might say, I don't have axioms. And yeah, because you don't have axioms, but it's like, well, when I say, would I just define axiom to mean whatever it is that you do in fact have, then I've won. When I just define God to mean whatever it is that you do in fact have, well, then I've won. And now you do have axioms and believe in God. Like, yeah, if I just define atheism as whatever anyone believes, right, then everyone is an atheist and I've won or something. It's stupid. Because that, that's just not true at all. So do you don't think a human being can exist within contradictions? Well, yeah, we have to exist within contradiction. But when the contradictions make themselves manifest, say in confusion with regard to direction, then the consequence of that technically is anxiety. And frustration and disappointment and all sorts of other things. So I sort of agree with this. I, I mean, I describe it as, as cognitive dissonance, but I think that this is something that Peterson and his fans experience. You know, it's not it's not that people who reject some sort of Jungian view of archetypes experience cognitive dissonance in the face of the overwhelming evidence that cognitive that um Jungian archetypes are and and uh religious, you know, quasi-religious worldviews are uh so well evidenced right that that people who are who are naturalists and atheists are just reeling you know you know developing all these bizarre beliefs in order to to maintain their original commitment to naturalism and atheism or something it in fact seems to be the opposite that people like peterson who believe in jungian archetypes and things are in fact you know so dissonant in the face of the overwhelming evidence from um, psychology, that that's a degenerate research program, uh, various considerations from philosophy, that those views are poorly motivated, um, and all sorts of empirical evidence that the kind of prophecies and predictions that they make based off of their Jungianism, you know, about this political event is a manifestation of um, the chaotic feminine, so it means the end times or whatever, you know, referring to, to COVID pandemics or whatever, whatever else. Um, when when those things in fact don't happen and it would falsi falsify the sort of claims that they've made or at least constitute some evidence against them they're then the ones who who engage in introducing all of these kind of bizarre auxiliary hypotheses uh, sorry or bizarre auxiliary beliefs in order to preserve the original commitment right but then explain why in this case their prediction or whatever didn't come true and you see that with Peterson's strange beliefs about like psychedelics, right? And it, his strange beliefs about um, a, a, about like climate change and, and politics and what what contemporary political um, events actually mean in light of his views about you know the archetypes of good and evil or whatever that are that are being manifested in in contemporary political discourse. When the people he he is claiming are evil in fact, do not herald in the end of the world. Um, he's got to come up with some ways of explaining that, right? Or when it turns out that they were correct in certain predictions that they made, um, he's got to go. And, and that's why he's got so many false beliefs is because of this sort of cognitive dissonance and preservation of originally false commitments. Right? Negative emotions, but the cardinal negative emotion signifying multiple pathways forward is anxiety. It's an entropy signal. But you don't think that kind of entropy signal can be channeled into into beauty? Anxiety is an entropy signal. That's bollocks, right? You know, entropy, in the sense I understand it, <laughs> is just to, is just to do with like how ordered physical states of affairs are. Um, now it's not it's not that like solid. You know, it's not that solids which have a different entropy to liquids give me less anxiety than liquids or something. Because of the the higher entropy of liquids than solids, liquids give give you more anxiety. Like that's just clearly bullshit, isn't it? That's not. It's not true that anxiety is a measure of physical entropy. Um, so again, he's just said he's using a word like entropy, which is supposed to make what he's saying sound like it's scientific and well informed. But it's just a completely misleading. It, it's either false, right, um, on a literal interpretation, or if he means it metaphorically. Well, then it's it's just completely misleading what he's saying. It's not I I don't actually understand what the metaphor is at all. That um, now, if he just means anxiety is a measure of disorder, um, maybe maybe that's right. But that's not you know disorder in the physical sense of entropy is not the same as psychological disorder, which is an epistemic notion 
of of how much we understand or or can accurately predict what comes next, which has nothing to do with the um, entropy of the physical system that we're in. Right? It, it's it's not like like I said, liquids are, are more anxiety causing than solids or something. And, into love and gases you know you really don't want to you really don't want to start thinking about about gases why does beauty and love have to be clear ordered simple well i would say it probably doesn't have to be it can't be reduced to clarity and simplicity because when it's optimally structured it's a balance between order and chaos not order itself if it's too ordered if music is too ordered it's not it's not acceptable. It sounds like a drum machine. It's too repetitive. It's too predictable. Sounds like this is just, you know, a matter of preference to me, to be honest. I mean, there's some very ordered music that I like. Like, um, take um, Handel's Messiah, right? Um, that is so ordered and precise. That kind of um, Baroque era, the, the polyphony of the different elements of the orchestra and especially I love when there's a harpsichord involved and you, you know, you hear these precise notes being hit um, and inter intertwining and weaving with, you know, the other elements of the woodwinds and so forth. Um, and the, and, and the voices as well. I mean, I absolutely love that. And that's, that's perfectly ordered. There isn't like, there isn't really chaos there though. I'm sure he can, he, he, he can sort of introduce it, you know, he, he can extend his definition of chaos and order infinitely. He, he What he means by chaos and order are infinitely malleable, so there's actually going to be no providing counterexamples ever to what he's saying. But, um, you know, I would, take, I would take that sort of music to be a paradigm example of something that's perfectly ordered and rational, you know. Um, so I don't know what he's on about. Like, music can't be too ordered. It, it has to have, well, it has to have some fire in it yes. along with the structure. I was in Miami doing a seminar on Exodus with a number of scholars, and this is a beauty discussion. When Moses first encounters the burning bush, it's not a conflagration that demands attention. It's something that catches his attention. Um, it's a phenomenon, and that means to shine forth. And Moses has to stop and attend to it, and he does. And he sees this fire that doesn't consume the tree. And the tree, the tree is a structure, right? It's a tree-like structure. It's a branching structure. It's a hierarchical structure. It's a self-similar structure. It's a fractal structure. And it's the tree of life. And it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the fire in it is... It's a fractal structure. No, a fra so a fractal means some... Like, again, he just says all these words, right? But it's not fractal if it isn't actually, you know, geometrically a fractal. Fucking hell. And there's nothing in the text about it being fractal. So what he's doing here is he's using Peugeot's dumb, stupid fucking definition of fractal meanings by which all he means is that strangely like a postmodernist there's an infinite number of ways of interpreting what's going on there right so this is actually a deeply postmodern point in the sense that he means fractal rather ironically given his hatred of postmodernism um but it isn't fractal in the actual geometrical sense the transformation it's always occurring within every structure. And the fact that the fire doesn't consume the bush in that oh representation is a, an indication of the balance of transformation with structure. And that balance is presented as God. And what attracts Moses to it, in some sense, is the beauty. Now, it's the novelty and all that. But None of this is in the text, by the way. Like a painting is like a burning bush. That's a good way of thinking about it, a great painting. It's too much for people often. You know, I, my house was and will soon be again completely covered with paintings inside. And it was hard on people to come in there because... Well, my mother, for example, would say, well, why would you want to live in a museum? And I think, well, I would rather live in a museum than anywhere else in some real... It's fucking crazy, man. Well, let me ask you one short-lived biological meat bag to another. Who is God, then? Let's try to sneak up to this question, if it's at all possible. Is it possible to even talk about this? Well, it better be, because otherwise there's no communicating about it, right? It, it has to be something that can be brought down to Earth. Well, we might be too dumb to bring it down. It's not just ignorant, it's also sinful, right? So, because there's not knowing, and then there's not wanting to know or refusing to know. Yeah. And so you might say, well, could you extract God from a description of the objective world, right? Is is God just the ultimate unity of 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 the natural reality? And I would say, well, in a sense, there's some truth in that, but but not exactly, because God, in the highest sense, is the spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. How's that for a biological <sighs> definition? How the fuck? Right. Suppose that classical theism is true, and God is immutable. How can I emulate being immutable, right? 
Do I just do this forever? And then am I being sinful by the fact that time is passing and I'm changing? Am I am I supposed to be impassable such that when V trips over and bashes her head on the floor and she's bleeding to death, right? I literally just I just look at her and go and and I and I'm unaffected emotionally. I'm supposed to be impassable like God. He's that spirit which I have to emulate. Um now obviously Peterson here is importing the, the the notion of the incarnation and Christ and he's and he's gonna say well Christ is God and you've got to emulate Christ but that's that's a different claim to God well <laughs> God as God you know God qua God is um this big fat nothing that we are supposed to you know it's supposed to emulate that's nothing like us whatsoever that makes no sense whatsoever now, if you bring, if you're claiming that you you're supposed to emulate that, now if you claim that um, Christ is God and that shows pe humans are there, so th then at least you're saying something you know that that I can understand and make sense of. But if you're just talking about God in and of God's self and not as an incarnational human, I can make neither heads nor tails of how on earth I'm supposed to emulate that. So, spirit is a pattern. The spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, in one sense, when we say the human spirit, mm -hmm. it's that. It's an animating principle. Yeah, it's a meta. An, it's animate, a an Elon Vital, you might say. And you might say, well, what's the pattern? Okay, well, I can tell you that to some degree. Imagine that, like you're gripped by beauty, you're gripped by admiration. Imagine that you come across a man frothing at the mouth. Do you take him to hospital or do you try to cast demons out of him? What you do is you try to cast demons out of him in Jesus' name and put them into pigs. So the pigs run off the edge of a cliff, um, making the price of pork go up for the next year. And that's how you emulate the spirit of it. No. <laughs> so, and you can just notice this. This isn't propositional. You have to notice it. It's like, oh, you have to notice. Turns it. out I admire that. Uh, notice the, so, so what I want to draw people's attention to as well is the, um, the kind of Gnostic, they hate that word. Um, the kind that you know that that i've got some special knowledge that the people who disagree with me don't have and this is psychologically in terms of the study of um cults and conspiracy theories um this this is a common psycho when, when this sort of thing this sort of thing appeals to the type of people that are going to get involved with um cults and conspiracy theories this idea that there's some special knowledge for those who are in the in group that they're noticing that no one else is and what it really does is it just makes the bizarre views immune to critique, right? Because if someone disagrees with you, rather than having to actually engage with their points and respond to the reasons that they provide to disagree, instead you just have this ad hominem critique available of, well, there's actually something defective about their their personhood, their, their, their cognitive faculties, their perception, such that they're not seeing it as they should be seeing it. Because if there weren't this thing defective about them, they would notice it. They'd see it the way that you see it, right? So it's not propositional, like. And then, uh, and then there's just this whole, you know, this whole ad hominem of like, uh, and then you can pretend it's backed up by the neuroscience by getting people like Ian McGilchrist with the left brain, right brain thing, and say, well, look, if you if you're just concerned with the propositional, then um, the left hemisphere of your brain is overactive, and you need to use the right hemisphere more, which is what I'm doing because I've integrated my whole brain. That's why I notice these bizarre claims that I'm making. Hmm. So what does that mean? Well, it means I would like to be like him or her. That's what admiration means. It means there's something about the way they are that compels imitation, another instinct, or inspires respect or awe even. Okay, what is that that grips you? Well, I don't know. Well, let's say, okay, fine, but it grips you and you want to be like that. Kids hero worship, for example, and so do adults for that matter, unless they become entirely cynical. <laughs> I worship quite a, quite a few heroes. Yeah, well, there you go. Proudly. Yes, well, yeah. there you go. And there's no, that worship, that celebration and, and proclivity to imitate is worship. That's what worship means most fundamentally. Now imagine you took. Wait, what did he say? That, that celebrate. I worship quite a, so, quite oh, a few this is another yeah, well, there you go. Bullshit. Yes, well, there you go. And there's no, that worship, that celebration and, and proclivity to imitate is worship. That's what worship means. Most celebration and proclivity to imitate. That's what worship means. I mean, that can be a part of worship, right? Would you say that the Psalms then are not worship? Um as the deer pants for the water, so my soul it longs for thee. The the lamentations of, are they celebrations? No. So are they not worship? 
well, according to Peterson, they mustn't be. Or is this just some fucking que- more question begging Peugeot and Wu, right? In order to say that whenever anyone celebrates anything, they are in fact accept, you know, even though they don't know it, they're accepting the existence of, uh, of the orthodoxly conceived monotheistic God. Most fundamentally. Now imagine you took the set of all admirable people and you extracted out AI learning. You extracted out the central features of what constitutes admirable. And then you did that repeatedly. You extracted out AI. Le- Wait, what? AI. Why did he mention AI learning? And and then when he says, when he, this talk of extracting out, right, as though there is a common essence to be, um, you know, to be pulled out of these people. So, the, the, I mean, this is a very important point, I think, at least, that, that Wittgenstein points out. Um, let me see if I, if I can. I'll just do it in a Google Doc to show people quickly. Where is it? Where is it? Um, so there's this. This is from a stream I did the other day. Okay, come on, computer work. Um, so I'm just going to delete all this crap. Right, suppose suppose in a set we've got the following entities, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Well, it could be that A and B, A and B are similar in certain respects, right? And then B and C, also a similar in certain respects, they have a kind of family resemblance. C and D, they're similar. B and E, they're similar, and so on. So the point is that all of these, all of these um, members of the set they actually share a resemblance to one another, right? And it might be on the basis of something like this, that we say um, someone's very wise or something like that. There's a kind of cluster of phenomena, which that, you know, they're, they all resemble each other. But by the time, you know, you, by the time you get to E from A, it's not that, that um, entity E and A, actually have some one thing in common to one another it's the fact that there's there's these relations between all the members this family resemblance that we say you know they're all wise or something like that but there isn't some one single essence that's necessary and sufficient such that you can say for any member that's in the set they definitely have these properties um and i and look, I, I tend to think that a lot of a lot of our ordinary language, like properties that we properties that we ascribe to things um, or people or behaviors, like being wise, um, like being very knowledgeable, or maybe like knowing things, um, they tend to be like this, where the words themselves are quite polysemous, which means that there are various different uses that we make of the words, but those different uses that in fact contain some one common essence, right? And I think that this is this is sort of a, a philosophical misunderstanding to suppose that there has to be some one common essence to, to the bits of language that are used. Means most fundamentally. Now imagine you took the set of all admirable people. So the set of all admirable people, according to me, admirable people. Well, there's gonna just be many, many different properties that are sufficient for being admirable, right? But there's not like, there isn't some one thing that's common to them all, such that it makes sense to talk about admirableness in in and of itself, sans any context, right, whatsoever. And you extracted out AI learning. You extracted out the central features of what constitutes admirable. And then you did that repeatedly until you purified it to what was most admirable. That's as good as you're gonna- Yeah, there is no such thing. It just doesn't make sense absent any context whatsoever to talk about it doesn't make sense to talk about something being admirable without there being like any um 
context of what's going on with a person and uh, and the behaviors that they're exhibiting and uh, and the situation that they're in and stuff you get in in terms of a it's like saying you know it's like saying what's best right you know what well what's best <laughs> representation of god and you might say well i don't believe in that it's like well what do you mean yeah it's not a set of propositional facts yeah what do you, what do you mean what i mean is that I don't think that there is in in reality. I don't think that it is true that there is an entity called God, right? I don't think that it is true that there is a being, a mindless, a, 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 a non physically dependent mind, a disembodied mind, um, who is timeless or or omnitemporal, um, who is omnipotent, who is omnipresent. Um, who has causal powers such that he can um, interact with a guy called Moses, such that he he somehow grounds morality, such that he incarnates as Jesus Christ, um, such that he he brings it about that Jesus Christ resurrects after being crucified. Um, I don't think that there is an ex nihilo creator of all of um, causal reality, right? So, so I can be very clear about what it is that I don't think is true. That's what I mean by God. That is what I reject. Now you can say, but you do things right. So that means you believe in God. Y yeah, okay. If that if that's what you need to survive modernism with your with your pathetic beliefs, then okay, you can have them. Facts. It's not a scientific theory about the structure of the objective world. And then I can say something about that too, because I've been thinking about this a lot, especially since talking to Richard Dawkins. It's like, okay. The postmodernist types, going back way before Derrida and Foucault, maybe back to Nietzsche, who I admire greatly. But Nietzsche, the postmodernist. The way, says God is dead. What about Kant, right? Kant, the postmodernist. It's like okay, but Nietzsche said God is dead, and we have killed him, and we'll not find enough water to wash away all the blood. So that was Nietzsche. He's no fool. He's got away with words. He certainly does. And so then you think, okay, well, we killed the transcendent. Well, what does that mean for science? Well, it frees it up because all that nonsense about a deity is just the idiot superstition. That Which really, you know. Stops the scientific um, what process from moving forward. That's basically the new atheist claim, something like that. It's like, wait a second. Really, I mean, maybe it is, but it's, not, it's certainly not what I think about science, right? Do you believe in the transcendent if you're a scientist? Oh, and fuck the, off. The answer is, well, not only do you believe in it, you believe in it more than anything else. Because if oh, you're a scientist, fuck off. scientist, you believe in what <sighs> objects to your theory more than you believe in your theory. Which is God, clearly. No, that's not true. That, that that would be, you would be irrational to think that. If you believe your theory is true, right, and at the same time, you believe that there is strong evidence that falsifies your theory, both simultaneously, you're irrational, right? You believe that you're, that there is strong evidence that your theory is false, entailing, which, which if you close that under entailment, right, entails that your theory is in fact false and you simultaneously believe your theory is true, then you are just strictly irrational. You you believe that your theory is true and that your theory is false at the same time. So that is not the essential characteristic of the scientist, is that they believe that their theory is true and that their theory is false simultaneously. Ah, oh. It's just so, it's like, moronic ridiculous claim after moronic ridiculous claim and this is why i get frustrated at the fact that people like Le i mean people like lex friedman are um you know these podcast hosts who have people like peterson on because they're just not in a position to challenge any of these ridiculous moronic claims that are made and even a lot of people who are in a position aren't going to because they're that afraid having someone who's popular like peterson on their show um, you know, they they want to get like the kudos and the views and the likes and things, and they want him to come on again. And so they're not going to like call him out on all this wacky nonsense that he says. Now, we got to think that through very carefully. So your theory describes the world. And as far as you're concerned, your description of the world is the world. But because you're a scientist, you think, well, even though that's my description of the world and that's what I believe, there's something beyond what I believe. And that's. The oh, yeah. Well, that, that's got to be God then, hasn't it? Like if 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 you have a belief that there are some things you don't know or you don't have, there are some things that exist, but that you don't know about. Well then, you know, one of those things has got to be God, right? That's fuck's sake.
object. And so I'm going to throw my theory against the object and see where it'll break. And then I'm going to use the evidence of the break as a source of new information to revitalize my theory. So it's right, right, but then you've just got a different, now you've got a different, th at that point when that becomes, if, if that becomes true that you do have such evidence, right? You no longer believe the original theory. Now you just have a new theory that you believe. And none of this has anything to do with a belief in God. This is this this comes down to beliefs about the way that the world is, and beliefs about how how epistemically to construct a, a correct theory, how to gather evidence, right? How to gather evidence and build up a theory. So as a scientist, you have to posit the existence of the ontological transcendent. <sighs> before that's you can... not transcendent. No, that's not what transcendent means. Ontological transcendent. The ontologic. You don't have to have a theory of the ontological transcendent. You have to have a theory of physical stuff. You don't even have to have a theory of it, right? You don't. You don't have to have some um, metaphysics of causation or something. You can. You can. You can just engage in the behaviors of collecting evidence without having any ontology, any specific ontology. My God, this is stupid. move forward at all, but more. You have to posit that contact with the ontological transcendent, annoying though it is because it upsets your apple cart, is exactly what will in fact set you free. So then you accept the proposition that there is a transcendent reality. No, you don't. And that the that contact with that transcendent reality Trans is redemptive in the most fundamental That's sense. True. Because if it wasn't, well, why would you bother making contact with it? You're going to make everything worse or better. Why does the uh... what the fuck? You might make things worse. I mean, look at the the um, op famous Oppenheimer quote, right? After the the engineer, you know, the Manhattan Project and the engineering of, of the atomic bomb, a lot of scientists face serious questions, uh, ethical questions of conscience after developing um, atomic weapons because they were like, "Holy shit, we are we are these stupid primates." who now have the capacity to destroy all life on earth. Um, should we have done this? <laughs> right. Um, so it's, it's not the case that scientists just simply proceed forward and think, yeah, uh, uh, my findings are necessarily good, right? The fine, and this is something Peterson himself has said, the findings of science are ethically neutral, how we choose to use them, right? It is what's, um, than ethical, good or bad. Uh, contact with the transcendent set you free as a scientist. Because you assume that, you assume, I mean, freedom in the most fundamental sense. It's like, well, freedom from want, freedom from disease, freedom from ignorance, right? That it informs you. So it's the, the logos in it. Science. It is definitely that. The logos. Yeah, it's, it's, the, that. it's the direction. Let's say the oh. directionality of science. That's a narrative direction, not a scientific direction. And then the question Constant. is, what is the narrative? Well, it posits a transcendent the narrative. reality. Like a postmodernist, what's the narrative that you're nested within? Okay, I don't want to hear about any of this. Posits that the transcendent reality is correct. What do you make of Elon Musk? You have spoken about him a bit. You I'm struck with admiration. Uh, That's cool. what I make so of him. We'll uh, yeah, I love when he makes all his workers come back to the office for no reason other than to encourage people to quit for economic reasons. I love when he manipulates the stock market. I love when he um, makes up this whole hyped thing about making car tunnels underneath LA purely to discourage funding for trains in LA so he can outcompete like, like so 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 he so there's a market for um thanks V. So that there's a market for for electric vehicles in LA rather than people moving to public transport. I mean, I love all that stuff. It's absolutely great. I love his fixation on us going to Mars to terraform the atmosphere of that planet rather than on fixing climate change on Earth. I mean that's just brilliant. Um we think of that as a primary well it's it's like do you find this comedian funny it's like, well i laugh at him you know what i mean it's not propositional again and so i would there are things i would like to ask mr musk about the mars venture i don't know what he's up to there it strikes me as absurd in the most fundamental sense because i think well it'd be easier just to build an outpost in the antarctica well fair enough then he agrees with me on that point <laughs> or in the desert well how much of the human endeavor is absurd well th that's what did nietzsche say great men are seldom credited with their stupidity <laughs> who the hell knows what musk is up to i mean obviously he's building rockets now he's motivated because he wants to build a, a, a platform for life on mars is that a good idea who am i to say you he's did. he's building the rockets man but i'd like to ask him about it i i would like to see that conversation i do think that having talked to him quite a bit offline i think these several of his ideas like Mars, like humans becoming a multiplanetary species could be 
one of the things that human civilization looks back at as duh i can't believe he's one of the few people that was really pushing this idea because it's the obvious thing for for society to, for life to survive yeah well it isn't obvious to me that i'm in any position to evaluate elon musk like i would like to talk to him and find out what he why is this why is this the thing where peterson finally says i'm not in any position to evaluate that you know psychedelics climate change theology yeah, politics every other topic in the world he's like yep yeah, here's a hot take elon musk well bro that's too far um i'm gonna have to exhibit some epistemic humility here i'm just in no position to talk about elon musk sorry and um, we'll have to move on to the next topic he's up to and why but i mean he's an impossible person what he's done is impossible all of it it's like he built an electric car that works now does it work completely and will it replace gas cars or should it i don't know but if we're going to build electric cars, he seems to be the best at that by a lot. And he more or less did that. People carp about him, but he more or less did that by himself. I know he's very good at distributing responsibility. I'm actually not sure that this is true at all. I'm pretty sure that Elon Musk bought Tesla as a company from people who were basically already there, right? Um, so I don't think he's done that by himself. And all of that, but he's the spearhead. And then that was pretty hard. And then he built a rocket at like one-tenth the price of NASA rockets. And then he shot his car out into space. That's pretty hard. And then he's building this boring company, more or less as a, what would you call it? It's sort of, it's this whimsical joke in some sense, but it's not a joke. He's amazing. And you're It's not a joke. And, and again, it was, it's pretty, it was pretty much to subvert um, funding for public transport in LA. So they wouldn't, so people wouldn't fund, you know, people would instead get behind the hype of the car tunnels rather than investing in public transport and trains. Starlink, delving into the uh, the depths yeah. of the mind. And Starlink, it's like, go Elon, as far as I'm concerned. And then, you know, he puts his finger on things so oddly. The, pro the problem is underpopulation. It's like, I think so too. I think it's a terrible problem that we're, the West, for example, is no longer at replacement with regard to birth rate. It means we've abandoned the virgin and the child in the most fundamental sense. It's a bloody catastrophe. And Musk, he's, he sees it, clear as can be. It's like, well, and where everyone else is running around going, oh, there's too many people. It's like, nope, got that. Not only, see, I've learned that there are, falsehoods and lies, and there are anti-truths. And an anti-truth is something that's so preposterous that you couldn't you couldn't make a claim that's more opposite to the truth. And the- It's like, if it's just wrong, it's wrong, right? If it's not true, it's not true. That there, there are, it's not like, so there, there are claims where we have credences towards those things, right? So say, oh, thank you, V. What, what's that? It's okay. Oh, okay. I thought it was like a HP source or something. Was gonna... <laughs> um, so there's like, you know, there's some claims like, um, I don't know. There are, there are 500 polar bears in, on, on the planet earth or something where look, I know there are some polar bears. I know there's not loads of them. So maybe my credence is, maybe I've got a credence of like 0.1 or something towards that being true. So, so I don't believe it, right? I think it's false. But I could think it's more, you know, my credence could be like 0.01, right? So there's claims like that. But there's some claims like, um, I don't know, bachelors are my left foot or something where i have i just have a credence of zero towards that proposition um two plus two equals seven you know i am the king of france all the these sorts of propositions i just have a credence of zero towards and that's that is as wrong as it can get right according to me but there's not like this moral, it's not like that anti-Christ or something, like like this is what Pe how Peterson seems to think about it. He's like that anti-Logos, that anti-Christ, if I give a credence of zero towards them. I mean, someone who thinks, um, someone who thinks incorrectly that the integ integral of x squared is 3x, right, or something like that, even though I give that a credence of, I just think they're mistaken. I don't think they're anti-truth. I don't think that they hate the truth. I don't think that they hate Jesus. I don't think that they hate God. I just think that they've got something wrong that I'm very confident is wrong, such that I give their answer a credence of zero, right? The claim that there are too many people on the planet is an anti-truth. 
So, you know, people say, well, you have to accept limits to growth and et cetera. It's like, I have to accept the limits that you're going to impose. So a claim like that, that there are too many people on the planet, right? I mean, I give that a credence of like 0.3. I don't believe it. But I mean, I can also see that, that how there could be some supporting reasons. I'm not confident enough in it to believe it outright. But it's not zero, right? My credence. So I wouldn't call it as wrong as someone could get because I think it's something that someone could plausibly believe, right? I can see how someone who is relevantly informed about the, the finite amount of resources that there are on the earth, you know, maybe the the land mass available to produce crops and the amount of food that would be required to support such a popular, you know, you know, such a population and so on, could in fact have very good reasons to think there are too many people on the earth. It's not what I think, but, uh, but you know, there are, the conditions of verification for the claim are at least there, such that it's not like an anti-true claim. Um, and that, you know, those, those conditions of verification are not, um, it's not a meaningless claim, I should say. And then the, those conditions of verification are such that it's not clear to me whether it has been verified or not, you know? Um, it's on me, because you're afraid. I'm only saying this to try and say something good about the positivists to annoy people who disagree with me, by the way. But of the future. That's your theory, isn't it? Okay. Well, it's an idea. It could be a right idea. It could be a wrong idea. I don't I think anti truth. Exactly. Here, I'll tell you why it's a wrong idea, mm -hmm. I think. So imagine that there's an emergency dragon. There's a dragon. Someone comes and says, there's a dragon. I'm the guy to deal with it. I'll tell you why that's wrong. Imagine there's a dragon. We're already in fantasy world. Fuck me. That's what the environmentalists say. The radical types who push limits to growth. Then I look at them and I think, okay. Imagine there's a dragon. That's what the environmentalist types say. But there's no dragon. Therefore, the environmentalists are wrong. Thank you, Jordan. Is that dragon real or not? That's one question. Dragons aren't real. Uh, climate change debunked or whatever. Well, I ask that the, question of myself every time I the, spend time alone. Is the apocalypse looming on the environmental front? Yes or no? I'll just leave that aside for the time being. I think you can make a case both ways for a bunch of different reasons. And it's not a trivial concern. And we've overfished the oceans terribly. And there are environmental issues that are looming large. Whether climate change is the cardinal one or not is a whole different question, but we won't get into that. That's not the issue. You're clamoring about a dragon. Okay, why should I listen to you? Well, let's see how you're reacting to the dragon. Well, usually the people saying this, Jordan, are um, climatologists. You know, they've, they've done PhDs in specific questions about, um, say, that the constitution of topsoil and um, the constitution that's required for agriculture to take place at the scales that it does to keep people fed or maybe they might be talking about ocean currents um or or um air currents in the way that that affects weather patterns on earth such that um you know areas where people farm will get enough rain and sunlight each year and not be turned into complete dust bowls um or maybe they're talking about the temperature in places and what, what temperatures those places are equipped to deal with. So, for example, the UK, right, having temperatures of 40 degrees C in summer, where a lot of the building materials that are used melt around that temperature. Um, the, the railways can't cope, so transport's disrupted. A lot of people die because the homes in the country are built to retain heat, um, and they don't do a very good job at shedding it, and old people die. Um, maybe the the water infrastructure isn't very good such that the reservoirs dry out and then there's not enough water for people and maybe people have done specific phds asking particular questions about this and then they're saying yeah like this is a problem you should listen to me and then you're just coming along with your you're like yeah but have you considered um that what you're saying here is that there's a dragon right and i've interpreted um, the the archetypes, I have consulted the entrails of a pig and found that, in fact, this, the, the alchemical symbolism of a dragon means that, you know, like, come on, Jordan. It... <laughs> First of all, you're scared stiff and in a state of panic. That might indicate you're not the man for the job. Second, you're willing to use compulsion to harness other people to fight the dragon for you. So now not only are you terrified, you're a terrified tyrant. So then I would say, well, then you're not the Moses that we need to lead us out of this particular exodus. And maybe that's a neurological explanation. It's like, if you're so afraid of what you're facing, that you're terrified into paralysis and nihilism, 
and that you're willing to use tyrannical compulsion to get your way? Tyrannical compulsion. It seems like Peterson's definition of tyrannical compulsion is just encouraging people to do stuff that Peterson disagrees with. Now, of course, there are people, you know, there are some groups of people that are extremists. Um, but that's that's true for every position, right? There's there's people who are, I mean, I mean, for example, is Peterson saying this about the truck, the the Canadian truckers who were refusing to deliver goods because of COVID or whatever? Is he saying, look, if you're willing, truckers, to use tyrannical compulsion um, to get what you want, well, then you're not the Moses to lead us out of this wilderness. Why why would he say this about climate activists who engage in protests? but not about truckers who engage in protests, right? Why would he be inconsistent in that way? Why would he think that the truckers are, in fact, the Moses to lead us out of the wilderness? Well, it's just because his values differ. So he's willing to use this metaf metaphysical substrate, metaphorical substrate, whatever, you know, just so story transcendent mumbo jumbo woo in order to justify basically whatever his prejudices are and the things that he disagrees with the things against the things that he disagrees with based on his values. But then when there are things that are that are identical, but he does agree with in terms of his values, he just turns a blind eye and doesn't consistently apply his um, his philosophical stories about the archetypes and alchemy and what's going on in order to call them out for being wrong. Right. And that and, and that's well, that's inconsistent. I mean, fair enough. I don't think I think Jordan's got bigger problems than irrationality. Right. But this is an irrational position it's an inconsistent position you are not the right leader for the time so then i like someone like bjorn lomberg or matt ridley or marion tupi and they say well look we've got our environmental problems and uh maybe there's a there you could make a case that there's a malthusian element in some situations but fundamentally the track record of the human race is that we learn very fast and faster all the time to do more with less and we've got this and i think yes to that idea and i think about it which is super irresponsible, right? Because, I mean, look at this summer being so dry and given the things happening in Ukraine and problems with um, gas supply and stuff in winter. I mean, how much food is going to be available next year, right? For example. Oh, we'll just figure it out. Well, yeah, but just figuring it out means a lot of people dying, right? Why not? Why not respond in advance <laughs> such that Tons of people don't die um, in some, it, 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 you know, in, in some kind of crazy event that we that was quite accurately predicted by various people who are relevant experts in that field. Yeah, but we'll survive, right? That's what the human race does. Man, it's kind of like I mean, you can make the same argument about not getting um, vaccinated against smallpox in whenever it was in the sixties or whatever, like. I mean, look, smallpox is pretty bad, but I mean, look, we've survived so far. So, I mean, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get vaccinated against smallpox because, um, you know, I, I don't want to be, so, they're, they're telling you that there's a type, they're, they're being tyrannical um, that making me get this vaccine. When I want to embody the human spirit of God and life and, uh, you know, it's just like, don't be a fucking idiot, Jordan. Um Didn't in a fundamental way. It's like, I trust Lomberg, I trust Tupi, I trust Matt Ridley. They thought about these things deeply. They're not just saying, oh, the environment doesn't matter, whatever the environment is. I trust, I trust anyone from the Ayn Rand Institute who tells me they have no, uh, I, I trust anyone employed by the Daily Wire or the Ayn Rand Institute to tell me the way that the world is. They would have no motives to, to, to lie or reason a particular way, right, about anything is you know the environment i don't even know what that is that's everything the environment oh, fuck, i'm concerned about the environment if your environmental models can't predict the stock markets then really you know how do we know that they can predict um how, how do we know that they can predict the environment look if your stock market models can't predict what i'm gonna do with my left foot next then how can i trust your stock market models which is, how is that different than saying I'm worried about everything? How, how are those statements different semantically? Well, yeah, the environment, it could be, I'm worried how about- How are they different semantically? Well, because everything doesn't mean the same thing as the environment in this context. So that's how they're different semantically. Fuck's sake.
Oh my god. Because what's meant by the environment here are several um you know se- se- several particular features of the earth. It's it's atmospheric it's average temperature in various regions of the atm- atmosphere. Um the 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 me- measures of albedo so how much white there is on the earth and how much um high how many i high energy photons are going to be reflected back off into space so this is captured by the atmosphere the constitution of the atmosphere and um how that constitution captures infrared energy various currents around the earth i mean this is what's meant by the environment right What's not meant by the environment is, you know, my ingrown toe. Because, okay, that's a part of reality, but it has a negligible effect on, you know, crop crop yield, yields or something like that. So what's meant by the, by the environment here are, are the features that are salient to human purposes, goals, and uh, values and desires, right? And at societal scale, human purposes, goals, values, and desires are things to do with like food production or how, how pleasant it feels to live and so forth. And these things like atmospheric temperature have a massive impact on, um, on our concerns. Whereas how bad my ingrown toenail is really has very little impact on, on broader human concerns. So it doesn't actually matter at all for a good environmental model that it doesn't take into account how bad my ingrown toenail is going to get right um now it seems like peterson seems to think it has to actually do that i'm not going li- to listen i'm not going to accept any of your environmental models until they tell me everything about nathan's ingrown toenail because you mean the environment you mean everything right and and that's something that's part of the environment it's just it's just this moronic whataboutism human society a lot of these complex systems are difficult to talk about because there's so much involved for sure yeah everything and yeah. then these models because people have gone after me because i don't buy the climate models well i think about the climate models as extended into the economic models because the climate model well that's because you're poorly informed and repeating conservative talking points from the 90s which have been extensively debunked by climatologists well, is, well there's going to be a certain degree of heating let's say by 2100 it's like okay some of that might be human generated. Some of it's a consequence of warming after the ice age. This has happened before, but fair enough. Oh, don't do the fucking medieval warm period. This isn't 2002. Let's take your presumption. Although there are multiple presumptions and any error in your model multiplies as time extends, but to have it your way. Okay, now we're going to extend the climate model, so to speak, into the economic model. So I just did an analysis of a paper by Deloitte, third biggest company in the US. 300,000 employees, major league consultants. They just produced... When he says, I did an examination of a paper, he made a bizarre video where he was go- He was like, um, you Malthusian, anti... It was just... that. That's not what I consider to be, um, you know, a, a scientific review of a paper myself. Report in May. I wrote an article for it in The Telegraph, which I'm going to release this week on my YouTube channel. He said, well, if we get the climate problem under control economically, because that's where the models are now being generated on the economic front. So now we have to model the environment, that's climate, and we have to model the economy, and then we have to model their joint interaction, and then we have to predict 100 years into the future, and then we have to put a dollar value on that, and then we have to claim that we can do that, which we can't, and then this is our conclusion. We're going to go through a difficult period of privation, because if we don't... Okay, so what he's saying here about predictions economically, I mean, you can, you obviously make clear what your assumptions are in the model so you might look at for example um the the emissions of various vehicles right um and how many people are using them and then you can you can look at kind of the the growth in the number of people using vehicles or changes in engine types and then you build those trends into your models right to predict the the emissions that are happening from from vehicles and now what you do is you include ranges in the model. So you say, well, look, here's here's the line um, making, you know, be- best kind of estimate. Here's the line of what happens if most people switch to electric vehicles or something. Here's the line of what happens in a worst case scenario where people just don't care. And, do- and, that, and that's what responsible model builders do. Those things are built in. They don't have to say a bunch of stuff about what's driving the market forces of people... Um, 
buying those cars and things, they can just build in the ranges. I mean, this is just, this is, again, just ridiculous. What about, he's, he's setting, he's just basically trying to create some impossible standards that he himself doesn't meet for any of the things that he believes in, right? So, for example, he active, he, he's not just advocating people withhold their judgment. He's actively advocating that, that climate change isn't going to be a problem, right? And it's not like he has models that meet this standard and tell him that climate change isn't going to be a model. So, so again, here's another place where he's inconsistent. He's just setting the bar um, ridiculously high for people to disagree with him to meet. And he doesn't meet that bar himself for his any of his own opinions. Except limits to growth, there's going to be a catastrophe 50 years in the future, thereabouts. And so to avert that catastrophe, we are going to make people poorer now. How much poorer? Well, not a lot compared to how much richer they're going to be, but definitely, and they say this in their own models, definitely poorer, definitely poorer than they would be if we just left them the hell alone. And so then I think, okay, poorer, did eh? Who? Well, let's look at They'll biology. A Got a hierarchy, right, of stability and security. That's a hierarchy, or one type. You stress a hierarchy like that, a social hierarchy. So oh, there's fuck, birds, you know, yeah, the love environment, says. and an avian flu comes in. And then you look at the birds in the social hierarchy, and the, the, the low-ranking birds have the worst nests. So they're most exposed to wind and rain and sun and farthest from food supplies and most exposed to predators. And so those birds are stressed, which is what happens. And we can conclude from this. What happens to you at the bottom humans. of the hierarchy, you're more stressed because your life is more uncertain. You're more stressed. Your immunological function is compromised because of that. You're sacrificing the future for the present. An avian flu comes Sounds plausible, though. You know, in my, in my um, plausibility structure that I'm assessing this with, using my system one thinking, this sounds plausibly like it has something to do with humans. So I'm just going to wholesale take whatever he has to say about it, right, and, and, and buy it. Comes in and the birds die from the bottom up. That happens in every epidemic. You die from the bottom up. Okay. So they oh, say when the Christ. aristocracy catches a cold, Bird the working Christ. class dies of pneumonia. All right. So now we're going to make people poorer. Okay. Who? You know who who else died from uh, like tuberculosis? I'm pretty sure that tons of the Rothschilds died from tuberculosis. I mean, this is something that's sort of funny, right? About these people being the richest family in Europe or whatever. And in fact, unable due to medical constraints at the time to treat bacterial infections um bacterial infections that the poorest person at least in the uk where we have free healthcare, nationalized healthcare, can can, can outlive now by just going and getting amoxicillin uh from from you know the the national health service right well we know who we make poor when we make people poorer we make those who are barely hanging on poorer and what does that mean? It means they die. And so what the Deloitte consultants are basically saying is, well, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. But according to our models, a lot of poor people are going to have to die. So that a lot more poor people don't die are in the they? future. It's like, okay, hold on a sec. Which of those two things am I supposed to regard with certainty? The hypothetical poor people that you're going to hypothetically save 100 years from now? Or the actual poor people that you are actually going to kill in the next 10 years? Well, I'm going to cast my lot with the actual poor people that you're actually going to kill. And so, and then I think further, it's like, well, okay, the Deloitte consultants, have you actually modeled the world? Or is this a big advertising shtick designed to attract? Ugh. I sped it up because it's three hours long, you fucking retard. Suck my dick. Your corporate clients with the demonstration that you're so intelligent that you can actually model the entire ecosystem of the world, including the economic system, and predict it 100 years forward. And isn't there a bit of a moral hazard in making a claim like that? Just like, just a trifle, especially when... So I talked to Bjorn Lomberg and Michael Leon last week. I accepted the UN uh, estimates of starvation this coming year. 150 million people will suffer food insecurity. Food insecurity. Yeah, food insecurity. That's the bloody buzzword. Famine. Well, Michael Leon thought 1.2 billion. And then that'll spiral because he said what happens in a famine is that the governments go nuts, crazy. The governments destabilize. And then... You are... Terrified, afraid, concerned about the dragon of something we can call communism, Marxism. Am I terrified of it? I'm well, terrified okay, enough okay. to be a tyrant. Your theories had two components. Yeah. But I'm not paralyzed. Had a, dragon, had a dragon. Yeah. I'm not paralyzed and I don't want to be a tyrant. The tyrant part, I think, mm -hmm. is missing with you. Uh, yeah. But so you are very concerned. The intensity of your feeling uh, does not right. give much space, actually, at least in your public persona for sitting quietly with a dragon and sipping in a couple of beers and thinking about this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the intensity of your anger, mm -hmm. concern 
about certain things you're seeing in society? Is that going to drive you off the path that ultimately takes us to a better world? That's a good question. I mean, I don't, I'm trying to get that right. So we've kind of come to a cultural conclusion about the Nazis. You get to be angry about the Nazis? Seems the answer to that is yes. Well, actually, let me push back here. Um, I also don't trust people who are angry about the Nazis. Because Fair, I mean the actual Nazis. <laughs> well, I, I, there's a lot, as you know, there's a lot of people in the world um, that uh, use actual Nazis to mean a lot I know, of things. I know. One of them is, is very important to me. Me, for example. Well, you, yes. they, they, <laughs> he's well, a Nazi I think, or magical super Nazi, as it turns out. I, I think they actually sort of steal men all their perspectives. I, I think a lot of people that call you a Nazi mean it. So yeah, but, but, <laughs> so but I'm like aware of that. Th there's an important thing there though because I, I went to the front in Ukraine. Yeah, and a lot of the I don't think Peterson is an actual Nazi. I also have issues with Lex's going to the front in Ukraine, which seemed like this kind of performative war tourism type thing. But people uh, that lost their home or their kind of uh, that got to interact a lot with Russian soldiers, Ukrainian people that interact with the Russian soldiers. Uh, they reported that the Russian soldiers really believe they're saving the the people of ukraine in these local villages from the nazis I understand yeah so to them well yeah but this is all part i mean this has is very easy to explain right when you consider um when you consider the kind of the kind of nationalistic russian story which includes <coughs> overcoming like the actual nazis in the second world war um and the massive sacrifice of life that there was the, the millions of, of people who died um, pushing the Nazis back, right? And this is like a massive... F first of all, they won in the end, right? The the, the Russians or um, the the CCCP. They... So, so they won in the end. And so this is a victory in their, in their ideological history, in their kind of nationalistic story that they might tell themselves. And... Putin in, you know, after, after the downfall of the USSR and trying to rebuild Russian national identity plays upon these stories that, that people can agree upon in, in Russian national identity historically in order to persuade people that they're the same good guys as they were in the past. You know, that it, it's, um, it's like what our forefathers did and we're doing the same thing now. So this is just a kind of like propagandistic move that just makes a ton of sense given Russian history and nationalism to to say that you're fighting the Nazis like your um like your forefathers did. But I don't I, I don't know where, where he's going with this, but I don't I don't think it it necessarily requires a lot of profound observations about um you know, like relativistic truth and so on. It's not just that the Ukrainian government has, or U Ukraine has some Nazis. It's like, it has been, the idea is that the Nazis have taken over Ukraine and we need to free them. This is the belief. Yeah, so like this is, again, II. Nazi is still a dragon that lives yeah. and, and it's used by people because it's safe to sit next to that dragon and spread yeah. any kind of ideology you want. So I just want to kind of say that we- um, So I think have... maybe, maybe what my objection is here is that Lex is looking for this general explanation of why um, the Nazis are being used in Russia and why the Nazis might be used as an example in the West, right? And he's looking for what's common to the two to form a general explanation of what's going on. Whereas on, in my view, um, those are two different cases with different explanations in each case as to why the Nazis are being used and what, why they're effective and powerful for those two different cultures, given their different histories and values. And so a general explanation here isn't actually very useful Um it's just it's just a kind of maybe an intellectual craving that we might have to find a general essence and explain it in that way. Um, but but what's actually more useful is to look at the particular differences between the two. I've so, agreed on the on the on the on the uh, on this particular dragon, but I still don't trust anybody who uses that. Yeah, one. but we have issues with boundaries, right? <laughs> no, no, it's so this is a very complicated problem, right? Yeah. So Rene Girard believed that it was a human proclivity to demonize a scapegoat and then drive it out of the village. And yeah. I've thought about that a lot. We need a place to put Satan. Like, seriously, this is a serious issue. Should he be inside the village or outside? Well, maybe he should be inside you. Right? That's that's the fundamental essence of the Christian doctrine. It's like Satan is best fought on the battleground of your soul. And that's that's right. It's right. Can you actually put words to the kind of dragon that you're fighting? Is it is it is it communism? Imaginary. The spirit of Cain. Yeah. yeah, it's an imaginary dragon. Can you elaborate? 
well, what the spirit of gain is. So, well, people who don't want to get vaccinated and kill other people's relatives, would that be the spirit of claim? Am I my brother's keeper? No, that wouldn't. Again, so Peterson's going to be inconsistent here, right? He's fine. Again, he just uses these stories um, as some kind of justification for things he dislikes personally. But it's not like the these stories are just post hoc rationalization because it's not like he just considers these stories. And then whatever follows from them, um, whatever, whatever follows from this line of reasoning, then motivates what his beliefs are. It's instead that he just has various beliefs and prejudices, and then he just uses these stories to selectively justify or rationalize what he wants to. So, you know, like, again, with with this Kane story, the, you know, the key, the key component is um, Kane saying, am I my brother's keeper, right, after... Uh, and not and not looking after him as he's killed him, and that's supposed to indicate some kind of deep sin in 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 human character. But you know, you can you can make that point about all sorts of things. That climate change, right? So Peterson's not taking climate change seriously, and it's going to harm and kill a lot of people. Well, aren't you your brother's keeper, Peterson? Peterson's going to be skeptical of vaccines and COVID lockdowns, but they're going to prevent the deaths of millions of people. Aren't you your brother's keeper, Peterson? So do you really care about the story of Cain and Abel? Or is this just some bullshit to um, justify and back up whatever conclusions you want, right? I think the latter. After Adam and Eve are thrown out of paradise for becoming self-conscious, or when they become self-conscious, they're destined to work. And the reason for that, as far as I can tell, is that to become self-conscious is to become aware of the future. It's to become aware of death. That certainly happens in the Adam and Eve story. To have the scales fall from your eyes. And then the consequence of that is that you now have to labor to prevent the catastrophes of the future. That's work. Work is sacrifice. Sacrifice of the present to the future. It's delay of gratification. It's maturity. It's sacrifice to something as well and yeah, in the spirit of something. Not any of that. Okay, so now Adam and Eve have two children, Cain and Abel. So those are the first two people in history because the Garden of Eden doesn't count. And they're the first two people who are born rather than created. So they're the first two people. And that's a hell of a story because it's a story of fratricidal murder that degenerates into genocide, flood, and tyranny. So that's fun for the opening salvo of the story, let's say. And Abel and Cain both make sacrifices. And for some reason, Abel's sacrifices please God. It's not exactly clear why. And Cain's don't. Now, there's a... Okay, so what's better for predicting the future here? Um, climatologist models or Genesis, the book of Genesis, right? Because it seems that Peterson here has an extreme amount of skepticism about how climatologist models map to predictions about um, human behavior, what's going to happen and what we should do. Whereas when it comes to the book of Genesis, um, you know, written thousands of years ago, about probably about 3,000 years ago, and probably, you know, being the result of various... Um, stories from oral tradition and so forth, which were around before then. Well, Peterson seems to think that these, in fact, are perfectly fine for our mapping how things are going to go now and how we ought to behave now, right? Where it seems like one of these things is going to be a little bit more accurate than the other to me. But apparently, you know, it's the opposite way to Peterson. Implication in the text that it's because Cain's sacrifices are true or second rate. God says that Abel brings the finest to the sacrificial altar. He doesn't say that about Cain. So you can imagine that Cain is sacrificing away, but he's he's holding something in reserve. He's not all in. He's not bringing his best to the table. He's not offering his best to God. And so Abel thrives like mad. And everyone loves him. And he gets exactly what he needs and wants, exactly when he needs and wants it. He's favored of God. And Cain is bearing this terrible burden forward and working. And his sacrifices are rejected. So he gets resentful, really resentful. Enough, resentful enough to call God out and say something like, this is quite the creation you've got going here. I'm breaking myself in half and nothing good's coming my way. What the hell's up with that? And then there's Abel, the sun shining on him every day. How dare you? It's like, okay, but this is God that Cain's talking to. And so God says what Cain least wants to hear, which is what God usually says to people. He says, look to your own devices. You're not making the sacrifices you should, and you know it. And then he says something even worse. He says, sin crouches at your door like a sexually aroused predatory animal and you've invited it in to have your way to have it <laughs> i remember it say i mean what is that is that the uh, niv that one peterson like a sexually aroused predatory animal <laughs> with you and so he basically says you have 
allowed your resentment to preoccupy yourself, and now you're brooding upon it and generating something creative, new, and awful, possessed by the spirit of resentment. And that, it must be the message, that one. That's why you're in the miserable state you're in. So then Cain leaves, his countenance falls, as you might expect, and Cain leaves, and he's so incensed by this because God has said, look, your problems are, are of your own making. And not only that, you invited them in. And not only that, you engaged in this creatively. And not only that, you're blaming it on me. And not only that, that's making you jealous of Abel, who's your actual idol and goal. And Cain, instead of changing, kills Abel, right? And then Cain's descendants are the first people who make weapons of war. And so that's, okay, you want to know what I think? That's the eternal story of mankind. And it's playing out right now. Oh, right. That's the, oh, it's playing out right now. So you're telling me that this, but how can you predict the stocks with that, Jordan? Can you tell me? It's all right. What was that? I just said from the real stuff. Oh, okay. Right now, except at a thousand times the rate. Can I present to you a difficult truth? Not perhaps not a truth, but uh, a thought I have that it is not always easy to know which among us are the king. That's for sure. And res yeah, I resentment. It is. Um, it is possible to imagine you as the person who has a resentment yes. towards a particular worldview exactly. that you really worry right. about. Ooh. Yeah. Well, I talked. I talked to a good friend of mine last week about that publicly. Well, we'll release it. So I said, well, do I have a particular animus against the left, let's say? Yes. It's like, well, probably. Okay, why? Well, first of all, I'm a university professor. Uh, it's not like the universities are threatened by the right. But I'm justified. They're threatened by the left. 100%. Are they justified? And they're not just threatened a little bit. Are they also justified in their anger then, Jordan? Can they just explain they're it? They're threatened a lot. And that threat made it impossible for me to continue in my profession the way I was. And it cost me my clinical practice too. And that's not over yet because I have 10 lawsuits against me out right now from the College of Psychologists because they've allowed anyone to complain about me anywhere in the world for any reason and have the choice to follow that up with an investigation, which is a punishment in and of itself, and are doing so. And then I've been tortured nearly to death. Well, I mean, that's one way to, I mean, I mean, suppose Peterson has actually done something wrong, right? What he's saying there is just a way to hand wave away anything he might have done wrong. Like it's unjustified for them to investigate him if these complaints come in. Multiple times by bad actors on the left. Like, you know, Jimmy Savile comes to mind, right? Now, I've had my fair share of radical right-wingers being unhappy with what I've said. But personally, it's been the left the whole time. Not only me, but my family. Put, it, my, put my family at risk in a big way and constantly. Like, not once or twice. Because many people get... Put my family at risk in a big way, which is why Michaela Peterson is now a famous influencer. And that's her full-time job. It cancelled once or twice. But I've been cancelled, like, 40 times. Each of, which, each of which made him famous. And I know, like, 200 people now who've been cancelled. And I can tell and they've all become famous are you without doubt that it is one of the worst experiences of their life and that's if it only happened except they all became famous and rich as a result it was once and so and then I also know that the communists killed 100 million people in the 20th century that the intellectuals excused them for it non-stop and still haven't quit that almost no one knows about it and that the specter of resentful Marxism is back in full force and so do I have a bit of an animus against that yes does it go too far I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out. The story you just told, it is seems nearly impossible for you, an intellectual powerhouse, not to have a tremendous amount of resentment. And well, and this is the. So let me challenge you. Yeah, let me yeah, challenge go you. Go right ahead. Let yeah. me challenge you. Can you steal, man, the case that uh, the prime minister of this country, Trudeau, wants the best for this country? No, I didn't take them from your desk. They're my permanent markers. Um, not here. They might be my permanent markers. This is not yours. Um, might be in my bag that you put pens and pencils in pencil case okay um a medalis. a good question where it is you go looking for your pencil case yeah it might be it might be on over there okay or it might be in a bag of mine somewhere okay. it might even be in the it might be in that it might be in in the okay. the brown one there and actually might do good things for this country as okay. an intellectual challenge sure um he seems to get along well with his wife he has some kids. 
There's no sexual scandals. And he's in a position where that could easily be the case. He seems to have done some good things on the oceanic management front. He's put a fair bit of Canada's oceans into marine protected areas, and that might be his most fundamental legacy, if it's real. I've been trying to get information about the actual reality of the protection, and I haven't been able to do that. But that's a good thing. So sorry, to the family thing, is there's that some speaks aspect- Speaks to his character. Of, his character. There is some aspect to him who's, that makes him a good man well, in that sense. Well, I mean, there's the evidence there. You know, I mean, he's not a Jeffrey Epstein profligate on the sexual front, so that's something. And his wife, they seem to have a real marriage, and he has oh, kids. at least he's not a pedo. That's good. So, you know, good for him. That's a good start by that. And, you know, he's taking some concern. At least he's not gay. Um, he has a wife. Boy, for a leader. Yeah, right. To be a right. Good man. Well, then I also thought, okay, well, after the Liberals had brought in a Harvard intellectual who was a Canadian to be their last leader, he didn't work out. And then they're flailing about for a leader. And the Liberals in Canada are pretty good at maintaining power and leadership and have been the dominant governing party in Canada for a long time. And so they went to Justin and said, okay. it seems like the story of war too is a time when the poor people suffer from the decision made by the powerful, the rich, the, uh, yeah, the political elite. Lead. Yeah. Let me ask you about the war in Ukraine. Oh yeah. I got into plenty of trouble about that too. You're, mm -hmm. you're just a man in a suit talking on microphones and writing brilliant articles. There's also people dying, dying fighting. It's their land, it's their country, it's their history. This is true for both Russia and Ukraine. Yep. It's people trying to ask, they have many dragons and they're asking That's themselves sure. a question, who are we? What is yeah. this? What is the future of this nation? We thought we are a great nation. And I think both countries say this. And they, they say, well, how do we become the great nation we thought we are? Yep. And so what, uh, first of all, you got in, in trouble. What What's the, the dynamics of the trouble? And uh, is well, it something it you that regret much... no, saying? No, no. This is Peterson repeating the um, Russian conspiracy theory that the reason the reason for the war is because the West is satanic, essentially. I thought about it a lot. I laid out four reasons for the war. And then I was criticized in the Atlantic no. for the argument was reduced to one reason, which was a caricature of the reason. I gave a variety of reasons why the war happened. Mismanagement on the part of the West in relationship to Russia and foreign policy over the last, since the wall fell. It's understandable because it's extremely complex. Hyper-reliance on Russia as a cardinal source of energy provision for Europe in the wake of idiot environmental globalist utopianism. Um, the Which is that in the wake of, it's not, if they'd taken what environmentalists said seriously, they wouldn't have planned Nord Stream 2. Germany instead would have kept the nuclear power plants, right? Or they would have moved more over to wind and things like that, rather than building Nord Stream 2. So it's actually, it, you know, in spite of the, it, it's because they've not taken environmentalist concerns seriously that they're dependent upon Russian uh, natural gas and so on. Jesus. Expansionist tendencies of Russia that are analogous in some sense to the Soviet Union empire building. And then the last one, which is the one I got in trouble for, which is Putin's belief or willingness to manipulate his people into believing that Russia is a salvific force in the face of idiot Western wokeism. And that's the one I got in trouble for. It's like, while well, you're justifying Putin, it's like, it's not well, only, it's not well, only. Well, he was in that video. He, he was, he was actually saying, yeah, Putin's got a point that, right? It's our, it's our fault because we are, you know, because we are under the power of Satan. Um, the Russians that think the West has lost its mind. Eastern Europeans think so too. And do I know that? It's like, well, I went to 15 Eastern European countries this, this spring yeah, and here, I talked to 300 political and cultural leaders. And you might say, well, they were all conservatives. Like, actually, no, they weren't. Most of them were conservatives because it turns out that they're more willing to talk to me, but a good chunk of them were liberals by, by any stretch of the imagination. And a fair number of them were canceled progressives. Well, so, because you're very concerned about um, the culture wars that perhaps are a signal of a, a possible bad future for this country, for this part of the world, that reason stands out. And do you sort of looking back at four reasons think it deserves to have a place in it? Uh, Miff asks me, do I have any names? The 200 people JP knows who were cancelled, uh, who became rich and famous. Well, I don't know 200, and I, I don't know if JP knows 200. Um, but people like Brett Weinstein, for example, and and his brother, who are, are now um, COVID conspiracy deniers, I mean, they've, they've become rich and famous. Uh, all the people in the intellectual dark web, you know. Um, Dave Rubin, for example, becoming like, rich and famous off the back of his associations with uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, people like Russell Brand who say, you know, crazy, basically any guru, right? Any, anyone who's a kind of social media influence guru who has bad hot takes and claims to have been canceled has uh, Joe Rogan, right? 
Joe Rogan, who made his 10 million deal with Spotify, who's constantly talking about being cancelled and so on. Um, a lot of these people are just rich and famous. As really. Kathleen Stock. Had you ever heard of Kathleen Stock before she became cancelled? I mean, maybe you haven't, right? But now, you know, now, now that she's been cancelled, she's a global figure and someone who, um, you know, conservative media outlets in the US in particular can't wait to interview and get their hands on. Whenever these people become cancelled, right, they always do the rounds on conservative media be, uh, and, and get paid tons of money. one of the four oh, because absolutely it, because it is you know uh well the four was bifurcated eh? because i said look putin might believe this and i actually think he does because i read a bunch of putin speeches and i have been reading them for 15 years and my sense of people generally and this was true of hitler it's like well, what did hitler believe well did you read what he wrote he just did what he said he was going to do and you might think well remember peterson thinks that that was the nazism was atheistic so take everything that he thinks about hitler with a pinch of salt well some people are so tricky they have a whole body of elaborated speech that's completely separate from their personality and the personality is pursuing a different agenda. And this whole body of speech is nothing but a front. Yeah. It's like, good luck finding someone that sophisticated. First of all, if you say things long enough, you're going to believe them. That's a really interesting and fascinating and important point. Even if you start out as a, as a lie, as a propaganda, I think Hitler is, is, is an example of somebody that I think really quickly you start to believe the propaganda. Well, you're, really you, you've thought a lot about AI systems. It's like, don't you become what you practice? And the answer to that is, well, absolutely. We even know the neurology. It's like when you first formulate a concept, huge swaths of your cortex are lit up, so to speak. Don't you become what you practice? I mean, come on, green giant. Let's calm down a little bit. Um, like, <laughs> the, the, I don't know if you have the advert in the US, but uh, my mum says you are what you eat. I eat green. So if I eat green giant sweet corn, I'll become a green giant. Um, I mean, look, if I practice um, coding a lot, I don't become code. If I practice tennis a lot, I don't become tennis. If I practice writing a lot, I don't become writing. I become good at writing, maybe. Um, I become good at tennis. I become good at coding. You know, if you practice a skill a lot, you become better at that skill. But you don't turn into the thing that that skill is doing. So that's a sort of bizarre, you know, you are what you eat claim. But as you practice and not, that... And when, you say, all, and when you say, as you do things more, you become better at them, it's like, well, yeah, of, of course that's true. You're not really saying anything deep or profound there. The right hemisphere stops participating, and then the, the, the left participates less and less until you build specialized machinery for exactly that conceptual frame. And then you start to see it, not just think it. And so if you're telling the same lies over and over, who do you think you're fooling? Think, well, I can withstand my own lies. Not if they're effective lies. And if they're effective enough to fool millions of people. No, okay, so so Miff was under the impression that he meant middle class people who posted something one time were chased out of employment. So this basically never happens, but the times that it does, they also become famous. I mean, look at like James Damore, for example, the Google employee who got fired and then subsequently, you know, did the rounds on all the concern. If they can find there's own there's very sparse examples of this, but when there are examples, people like Peterson want to have them on the podcast and have them promoted and things. And then there was that woman, um, the school teacher who it happened to as well. And then, you know, Peterson had her on the podcast and promoted her and so forth. So, so when there are examples of, you know, the ordinary people being oppressed in this way, um, actually they love that, right? Cause that's the narrative that they want to push. So then they promote these people and they do become sort of like um, conservative talking points and media personalities. people and then they reflect them back to you what makes you think you're going to be able to withstand that you aren't and so i do think putin believes to the degree that he believes anything i do believe that he thinks of himself as a bulwark for to the degree that he believes anything <laughs> against the degeneration of the west and that's that third way that dugan and putin have been talking about the philosopher alexander dugan and putin for 15 years now what that is is very amorphous solzhenitsyn thought the russians would have to re return to the incremental development of Orthodox Christianity to escape from the communist trap. And to some degree that's happened in Russia because there's been a return to Orthodox Christianity. Now you could say, yeah, but the Orthodox Church has just been co-opted by the state. And I would say there's some evidence for that. I've heard, for example, that the Metropolitan owns, now I don't know if this is true, owns $5 billion worth of personal Kevin. property. And I would say there's a bit of a moral hazard in that. And it's possible that the Orthodox Church has been co-opted, but there has been somewhat of an Orthodox revival in Russia. And I don't think that's all bad. Now, even if Putin doesn't believe any of this, if he's just a psychopathic manipulator, and unfortunately, I don't think that's true. I've read his speeches. It doesn't look like it to me. And he is by no means the worst Russian leader of the last hundred years.
Well, there's quite a selection there. There, there certainly is. But, and I say that knowing that. Oh, that's all right then. Even if he doesn't believe it, he's convinced his people that it's true. And so we're stuck with the, we're stuck with the claim in either case. And that's the point I was trying to make in the article. Sometimes I'm troubled by people that explain things. And I, I've, a lot of people reached out to me, experts telling me how I should feel, what I should think about Ukraine. Oh, you naive. Lex, you're so naive, you know, here's how it really is. But then I get to see people that lost their home. I get to see people on the Russian side who believe they're, I genuinely think that there's some degree to which they have love in their heart. Uh, they, they see themselves as heroes, saving a land from uh, from Nazis. How else would you motivate young men to go fight? It's just, it's these humans destroying not only their homes, but creating generational yeah, hate, like that, destroying um, the possibility of- You know, that video of the guy with a Stanley knife cutting the bollocks off of a captured Ukrainian soldier. Um, he just thinks he's liberating that man from, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I won't show the video because to in order to drive the cognitive dissonance pedal home for anyone who believes that. I mean, look, there's, a, there's an extent to which that's probably true, that people are, you know, being manipulated by propaganda to think that they're the good guys here. But I also, but, but I mean, what's the motto of the Wagner group, for example, who are being extensively used by the Russian military? Um, not here for a cause, just here for violence. Those are the patches of, of the people in the Wagner group, right? They don't give a damn, right? They're, they're, they're just assholes and criminals, right? Some of them, not all of them, of course. Of love towards each other. They're, they're basically creating hate. What I've heard a lot of is on February 24th of this year, hate was born at a scale that region has not seen hate towards not vladimir putin hate towards not the soldiers in russia but hate towards all russians mm -hmm. hate that will last generations and then you can you, you can see an, um just the the pain there and then then when, when all these experts talk about uh um uh, agriculture and energy and geopolitics and yeah maybe like what you say with with the fighting the ideologies of the woke and so on. I just feel like it's missing something deep that war is not fought about any of those things. War is started and war is averted based on human beings, based on well, here's, humanity. Here's another, here's another ugly thought since we haven't had enough so far. We lock everything down for COVID. How much face-to-face -face communication was there between Say. the West and Vladimir Putin? Yeah, that's the problem. COVID lockdown caused the war in Ukraine. Oh my God. Peterson, what happened in 2014, you moron? The annexation of the Crimea, the little green men. Oh, I guess that was just caught. That 2014 just happens to be the year that the company Zoom was founded. No, come on. There's not, there is no connection between face to face communication and the fact that Putin started the war in Ukraine, right? It, this is clearly not why. It's clearly been on the books for years. Um, it, it's clearly been one of the main goals of um, of Putin's regime for a while. You know, it that the war in the Donbass, the the support, the support of the um, of the various kind of rebellions and so forth by Russia, it's been on the books for a very long time that there was going to be an invasion. Which is why, since 2014, for example, the British government has been training Ukrainian officers, and the West has been funding you know, the U the Ukrainian military and why there's such a difference now between the Ukrainian military and the military in 2014. How about none? Yeah. How about that was the wrong amount? Especially given that Europe was completely dependent on Putin for its energy supplies. Well, not completely, but you know what I mean. Materially and significantly. So maybe he had to go talk to him once every six months. Maybe he's in a bit of a bubble. Probably. And not just an information bubble, how all these experts tell me about. Yeah. No, a human, human bubble. You human bet, bubble. Man. Look, one of the things I've really learned, there's a real emphasis on hospitality in the Old Testament. I just brought all these scholars together to talk about the Exodus. Hey, I have the security team with me and they're tough military guys, but they're on board for this mission, let's say. And so they went out of their way to be hospitable to my academic guests. They laid out nice platters of meat and cheese and crackers. They spent all day preparing this house I'd rented so that we could have a hospitable time with these scholars, most of whom I didn't know well, but who said they would come and spend eight days talking about this book with me. We rented some jet skis. We had a nice house. We had fun. Oh, fuck We got that. to know each other. I know what this is. This is that picture of Jonathan Peugeot that I saw where Peugeot's like... Peterson's girlfriend on the back of a jet ski holding around his waist and Peterson's and this is you know the jet skis oh my god it all fits together do you guys remember 
the um, the video that Peterson made in the COVID pandemic about how hard it was to buy a jet ski. Well, why was he buying jet skis? It was for he was like, you goddamn bastards. I've been trying to buy a jet ski for days and I was on hold for hours. It was this was why he was trying to get the jet ski. It's so ridiculous. It's like a rich, wealthy old man with nothing better to do, getting wound up by like being inconvenienced in various ways. And so now he hates the COVID pandemic and he's tied it into all of this metaphorical wooey nonsense. <sighs> so yeah anyway that's going to be a mess because when he says these scholars right i wonder who these scholars are going to be i mean are we going to see joel bade in that no i doubt it i mean i think it's probably going to be fairly fringe conservative scott but we'll see we'll see what that turns out to be and if jonathan peugeot is involved it's guaranteed to be trash but trust each other because we could see that we could have some fun and that we could let our hair down a bit we didn't have to be on guard and that made the talks way deeper and then we found out we could do that in eight days, and so deeper meaning I, more, more crazy and fringe. I had proposed very early on that we're going to double the length, and so I pulled eight people out of their lives for for eight days. That's a that's not an easy thing to do. It's also quite expensive. And the Daily Wire Plus people picked all that up, and they said right, they said yes right away. So we'd love to do this again. Well, why? Well, partly because it was intellectually it was unbelievably engaging. Well, because some rich guy paid for them to have a holiday for a week. Engaging. Right? I learned so much. It'll take me like a year to digest it if I can ever digest it. And but they had they had a really good time. And so when they were offered that combination of intellectual challenge, let's say in hospitality, it was a no brainer. They just said, every one of them said, if I can do it in any way, I will definitely be there. And this, I went to Washington a bunch of times and the, the culture of hospitality has broken down in Washington. 40% of congressmen sleep in their offices. They don't have apartments. Their family isn't there with them. They don't have social occasions with their fellow Democrats or Republicans, much less across the table. And so, and I tried to have some meetings in Washington that were bilateral a couple of times, get young Republican congressmen and Democrats together to talk. And as soon as they talk, they think, oh, it was so interesting because one of the lunches was about 15 people, half Democrats and half Republicans. And all I'd ask them to do. Okay, yeah? let me ask you about thinking in general. Yeah. Um, this is something maybe that you and Jim Kelly think a lot about is thinking how to think. Um, how do you uh, think through an idea? Well, first of all, I, I think, okay, that's a really good question. We tried to work that out with this essay app that my son and I have developed because if you're going to write, the first question is, well, what should I write about? What's well, the name of the app? Essay.app. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the first question is, well, what bugs you? What's bugging you? This is such a cool thing. It's like, where's my destiny? Well, what bothers you? Well, that's where your destiny is. Your destiny <sighs> is to be found in what bothers you. Why did those things bother you? There's a lot of things you could be bothered by. Like a million you things. You bother man. me, Jordan. But some things grip you. You are they bug my you. destiny. They might make you resentful and bitter because they yeah. bug you so much. Like, they're your things, man. They've got you. So then, I look for a question that I would like the answer to, that I don't, and I would really like the answer to it. So I don't assume I already have the answer because I would actually really like to have the answer. So if I could get a better answer, great. And so that's the first thing. And that's like a prayer. It's like, okay, here's a mystery. I would like to delve into it further. Well, so that's humility. It's like, here's a mystery, which means I don't here's know. Here's a mystery. I would like Pray to delve into it, it further, which means destiny. I don't know enough already. How, that, how to and think then, clearly. Then comes the revelation. Pray about it's it. Like, well, what's have the revelation? It. Oh my God. If you ask yourself a question. Think about that right okay how do you think clearly about a question pray about it expect a revelation from the divine <laughs> like it's a real question do you get an answer or not an answer is well yeah thoughts start to appear in your head so from somewhere that's right from where, somewhere where, where do they come from do you have a sense depends on what you're aiming at depends on the question Wait, no I, no it, no it does to some degree it depends peterson shares augustine's epistemology of divine illumination it depends on your intent so imagine that your intent is to make things better. Then maybe they come from the place that's designed to make things better. Maybe your intent is to make things worse. Then they come from hell. And you think, not really. It's like, you're this so is sure. Just, this is like the opposite of what you should be doing in critical thinking. It's sort of like, you know, suppose that a, politi a politician has just given a rousing speech where they made a number of claims and you're thinking of voting for them. So what do you do? Pray about it, have a revelation. Uh, and then if you decide, you know, the other side was evil. Now, now you should vote for them. Like this is the opposite of of how you should critically evaluate claims, right? Just basically delve into system one and develop a bunch of, um, develop a bunch of emotional and religious dispositions and heuristics for dealing with problems that 
that don't engage system too. What about that, are but you? Is your intent conscious? Like, are you able um, to suspect It's, it's conscious intent? and habitual, right? Because as you practice something consciously, it becomes habitual, but it's conscious. It's like I, when I sit down yeah. before I do lecture, I think, okay, what's the goal here? Habitually right. use system one. Do the best job I can. To what end? Well, people are coming here, not for political issues. They're coming here because they're trying to make their lives better. Thank you. Okay, so what are we doing? We're conducting a joint investigation into the nature of that which makes life better. Okay, what's my role? To do as good a job about that as possible. What state of mind do I have to be in? Am I annoyed about the theater? Or am I do I, am I clued in and thrilled that 4,000 people have showed up at substantial expense and trouble to come and listen to me talk? And if I'm not in that state of mind, I think, well, maybe I need something to eat or maybe I need to talk to someone because that ingratitude is no place to start. It's like, I should be thrilled to be there, obviously. And so that, that orientation has to be there. And then I, is it conscious? All this is conscious. What am I serving? The highest good I can conceptualize. What is that? I have some sense, but I don't know it in the and, and then you kind of scour your heart and you think, is that really what you want? Are you after fame? Are you after notoriety? Are you after money? I'm not saying any of those things are necessarily bad, but they're not optimal, especially if you're not willing to admit them, right? And so they can contaminate you. So you want to be decontaminated. So you have the right trip, let's say. And, and so you have to put yourself, that's let's a meditative say. practice. You have to put yourself in the right receptive position with the right goal in mind. Then you can- Doggy style. And I think you can get better and better at this. Then you can trust what's going to happen. You know, so for example, before I came here, then you can I, trust I mean, what's going to happen. You have a reason what for doing the, the podcast. Then you can trust what's going to happen. With me? What's the reason? Um, Get money. I mean, we wanted to talk for a long time. Yeah. So the reason has evolved. The One of Get views, the reasons is I've listened takes. to you uh, for quite a long time. So you become a one-way friend. Also, Lex views himself as a techno monk with all these insights. And I have many one-way friends. Some of my best friends don't even know I exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, I'm a big fan of podcasts and audiobooks. Actually, most of my friends are dead. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> the writers. The definition are... of a reader. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with a lot of dead, great dead friends. So I wanted I wanted to meet this one-way friend, I suppose, and have uh, a conversation. And then there's this kind of puzzle that I've been longing to solve, the same reason I went to Ukraine, of asking this question of myself, uh, who am I? And what was this part of the world? What is this thing that happened in the 20th century that uh, I lost so much of my family there? And I feel so much of my family is defined by that place. Mm -hmm. Now that place includes the Soviet Union. It includes Russia and Ukraine. It includes Nazi Germany. It includes these big, powerful leaders and huge. I didn't want to be left out. I didn't want to be left out from the war, so I made it about myself. Is, this terrible answer is yes, to the degree that you're willing to do it voluntarily. And then you might ask, well, why should I have to subject myself to death and hell? <sighs> so a form of at least in part, involuntary suffering is depression. Do you have advice for people on how to find a way out? You're a man who has suffered in this way, perhaps continue to suffer in this way. How do you find a way out? The first thing I do as a clinician, if someone comes to me and says they're depressed, is ask myself a question. Well, what does this person mean by that? So I have to find out, like, because maybe they're not depressed, maybe they're hyper anxious, or maybe they're obsessional. Like, there's various forms of powerful negative emotion. So they need to be differentiated. But then the next question you have to ask is, well, are you depressed or do you have a terrible life? Or is it some combination of the two? Wow. Yeah. So if you're depressed, as far as I can tell, you don't have a terrible life. You have friends, you have family, you have an intimate relationship, you have a job or a career. You're about as educated as you should be given your intelligence. You use your time outside of work wisely. You're not beholden to alcohol or other temptations. Um, you're engaged in the community in some fundamental sense and all that's working. Now, if you have all that and you're feeling really awful, you're either ill or you're depressed. And so then sometimes there's a biochemical route to that, treatment of that. My experience has been as a clinician is if you're depressed, but you have a life and you take an antidepressant, it will probably help you a lot. Now, maybe you're not depressed. Exactly. You just have a terrible life. What does that look like? You have no relationship. Your family's a mess. You've got no friends. You've got no plan. You've got no job. You use your time outside of work, not only badly, but destructively. You have a drug or alcohol ha habit or some other vice, pornography addiction. So you um, can't be you depressed. You're completely unengaged in the surrounding community. You have no scaffolding whatsoever to support you in your current mode of being or you move forward. And then as a therapist, well, you do two things. Well, if it's depression. <laughs> so do you get eight, eight hours of sleep a night? And is your diet, are you, you know, and are you eating a healthy, balanced diet? Because if you are and you still feel bad, you must be depressed. But, um, you know, if your sleeping patterns are in fact um, atypical, and you know you get up late in the morning you're not very enthusiastic about work and all these things well then you can't be depressed in that case it's not that these are symptoms of depression but you can't be depressed because all those things need to be right and you still feel bad in order to be depressed yikes per se well like i said there's sometimes a biochemical route 
I mean, just ways that can be I mean, my view, my view of these kind of like psychological um, disorders is that they're, of course, like fuzzy, right? So it's not like someone's soul is in a particular state and you need to figure that out. And that's how you attach the label depression to it. That's how you really get the disorder. You know, I think there's a number of things going on. But what I'm getting at is I just don't think he's right to say you have to control for all these other things because depression can be a lifestyle disorder, right? Um, as well as those things can be controlled for and people can still feel bad and it's and it's complicated. <laughs> It's probably physiological if you're, at least in part, if you're depressed but you have an okay life. Sometimes it's conceptual. You can turn to dreams sometimes to help people because dreams contain the seeds of the potential future. And if your person is a real good dreamer and you can analyze dreams, that can be really helpful. But that seems to be only true for more creative people. And for the people who just have a terrible life, it's like, okay, you have a terrible life. Well, let's pick a front. How about you need, how about you need a friend? Like one sort of friend. Do you know how to shake hands and introduce yourself? I'll have the person show me. Depression So let's cured. do it for a sec. So this hi i'm jordan and people don't know how to do that and then and now they can't even no get the ball rolling depressed. for the listener jordan just gave me a firm handshake yeah as opposed to a dead fish you know and, and there's these elementary social skills that hypothetically if you were well cared for you learned when you were like three yeah. and sometimes people have i had lots of clients to whom no one ever paid any attention and they needed like ten thousand hours of attention and some of that was just listening because they had ten thousand hours of conversations they never had with anyone and they were all tangled up in their head and they had to just one client in particular i worked with this person for 15 years and what she wanted from me was for me just to shut the hell up for 50 minutes which was very hard for me <laughs> and to just tell me what had happened to her and then what happened at the end of the conversation then i could discuss a bit with her and then as we, we progressed through the years the amount of time that we spent in discussion increased in proportion in the sessions until by the time we stopped seeing each other when my clinical practice collapsed we were talking about 80% of the time. But she literally, she'd never been attended to properly, ever. And so she was an uncarved block in the Taoist sense, right? She hadn't been subjected to those flaming swords that separated the wheat from the chaff. And so you can do that in therapy. If you're listening and you're depressed, I would say if you can't find a therapist, and that's getting harder and harder because it's actually become illegal to be a therapist now because you have to agree oh, with your clients, yeah. which is a terrible thing to do with them. It's illegal to Just be like a Just like it's terrible now. to arbitrarily Jordan oppose them. Peterson, you could do the self-authoring program online because it helps you write an autobiography. And so if you have memories that so are more Jordan, than 18 months old, the body... So you. Jordan is under investigation by the APA and her, is no longer a clinician. And so he's like, don't listen to the guys who have the professional accreditation anymore. Instead, you know, get, find find someone fringe outside of the, the governing body because my conspiracy theory is true that they're all corrupt. Jesus. When you think them up, part of you is locked inside that. An undeveloped part of you is still trapped in that. That's a metaphorical way of thinking, but that's why it still has emotional significance. So you can write about your past experiences, but I would say wait for at least 18 months if something bad has happened to you, because otherwise you just hurt yourself again by encountering it. You can bring yourself up to date with an autobiography. There's an analysis of faults and virtues, that's the present authoring, and then there's a, a guided writing exercise that helps you make a future plan. That's young men who do that, could go to college, young men who do that, 90 minutes, just the future authoring, 90 minutes. They're 50% less likely to drop out. That's all it takes. So sometimes depression is the, is this heavy cloud that makes it hard to even make a single step towards it. Or you said isolate, yeah. make a friend. Oh man, sometimes the like first I, step I, is extremely oh, difficult. Oh, oh my God, sometimes it's it's way worse than that. Like I had clients who were so depressed they literally couldn't get out of bed. So what's their? But then they couldn't have been depressed given his previous definition of depression, where he said, you know, if you're getting the right amount of sleep, then and, and that's the wrong amount of sleep so they can't be depressed according to, to peterson's definition of depression that he gave earlier right first step it's like can you sit up once today no can you prop yourself up on your elbows once today like you just you scale back the dragon till you find one that's conquerable that moves you forward there's a there's a rubric for life scale back the dragons till you find one conquerable and it'll give you a little bit of gold commensurate with the struggle but the plus side of that because that's you think that god that's depressing you mean i have to start by sitting up while well, you do if you can't sit up but the, the plus side of that is it's the Pareto distribution issue is that aggregates exponentially increase and failures do too by the way but aggregates exponentially increase so once you start the ball rolling it can get zipping along pretty good this person that i talked about um notice how he brings you know some random general explanation that he's very committed to in to explain this particular thing 
despite there being no empirical evidence that this is the Pareto distribute that there's a Pareto distribution of like sitting up or something. And this is to do with economics and that it, it it's just was incapable of sitting with me in a cafe when we first met, just talking, even though I was her therapist. But by the end, she was doing stand-up comedy. So, you know, it took years, but still most people won't do stand-up comedy. That's that's quite the bloody achievement. She, she would read her poetry on stage too. So for someone who was petrified into paralysis by social anxiety and who had to start very small, it was a hell of an accomplishment. Yeah, it all starts with one step. Do you have advice for young people in high school? You've given a lot of people look up to you for advice, for strength, for um, strength to search for themselves, to find themselves. Take on some responsibility. Do something for other people. You're doing something for yourself while you're doing that, even if you don't know it, for sure, because you're a community across time. Find, find something to serve. Somebody to help. Someone to help. To a job. To find a job. Do your best with the customers. Don't be above your job. You're going to get an entry-level job when you're a kid. Well, what else would you want? You want to be the boss? What do you know? You don't know anything. You're a community. You could be the boss of your time. job. You know, if you're working in a grocery store, you're working in a convenience store, assuming you're not working for terrified tyrants, you can be nice to the customers. You can develop your social skills. You can learn how to handle a boss-employee relationship. You can be there 15 minutes early and leave 15 minutes late. Like, you can learn in an entry-level job, man. And I'll tell you, if you take an entry-level job and you learn, and it's a reasonably decent place, you will not be in an entry-level job for long. Because everyone who's competent is desperate for competent people. He contradicted himself. If you go himself. and show yourself as competent, don't care if he's an expert. But if you go show yourself as competent, all sorts of doors you didn't even know were there will start opening like mad. So you strive for competence. For craftsmanship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For discipline. You know, I mean, I, I said in one of the chapters in my books is, is is focused on putting your house in order. It's like, well, how do you start? Make your bed. You know, I, I it actually took me quite a long time in my life before I made my bed regularly in the morning. Most of my life was put in pretty good order, but that was one thing I didn't have in order. My clothes in my closet as well. All that's in order. Not all of it. I'm cleaning out some drawers right now, but look around and see what bugs you in your room. Just look. It's like, okay, I'm in my room. Do I like this room? No, it bugs me. Okay, why? Well, the paint's peeling there and it's dusty there and the carpet's dirty and that corner's kind of ugly and the light there isn't very good and my clothes closet's a mess so I don't even like to open it. Um, okay, that's a lot of problems. That sucks. That's a lot of opportunity. Pick something and fix it. Something that bugs you. Yeah, but not too much. So it, the rule is pick something that you know would make, pick a problem. Pick, I think this is all right. What pick saying. a solution to it that you know wouldn't help, that you could do. If only he stuck to just this. That you would do. So you have to negotiate with yourself. It's like, well, I won't clean up this room. How do you know? I've been in here for 10 years and I've never cleaned it up. It's like, well, obviously that's too big a dragon for you. Would you clean one drawer? Find out. And so imagine now you want to be happy when you open that drawer and you think, well, that's stupid. It's like, is it? Maybe it's your sock drawer, which I cleaned up in my room the other day, by the way. You're going to you're gonna open that every morning. Yeah. So that's like 30 seconds of your life every day. Okay, so that's three minutes a week. That's 12 minutes a month. That's two hours a year. So maybe your life is made out of, you've got 16 hours a day. Let's figure this out. Five, 12 in an hour, 12 in an hour, 144 in 12 hours. Yeah, let's say 200. 200 five-minute chunks. That's your life. Ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Peterson did just some math how many five-minute chunks there are in a day. And I'm I got pretty sure that's pretty accurate. It's, yeah. it's approximately right. So you got 200 five-minute chunks and they repeat. A lot of them repeat. So if you get every one of those right, they're trivial, right? Who cares what my sock drawer looks like? It's like, fair enough, man, but that's your life. The things you repeat every day. The mundane things. I think I could get all those mundane things right. That's the game rules. It's like now all the mundane is in place. Now you can play because all the mundane's in place. And this is actually true. So with children, imagine you want your children to play. Well, play is very fragile neurologically. Any competing motivation or emotion will suppress play. So everything has to be in order. Everything has to be a walled garden before the children will play. That's a good way of thinking about it. So you put everything in order and you think, oh my God, now I'm tyrannized by this order. It's like, no, you aren't. Not if it's voluntary. And then the order is the precondition for the freedom. And so then all of a sudden you get all these things in order. It's like, oh, look at this. I've, I've got some room to play here. And then, then maybe you're not depressed. No, it's, it's often not that simple. You know, it's not that that simple. Try putting your room in order. Perfect order. That's hard. I and mean, it's a really powerful way to think about those five minute chunks. Just get one of them right in a day. Yeah, Just well, if you do that right. for 200 days. I'm pretty sure he did 24 times 24 wrong. Right. Right. A day. And I'm I got pretty sure that's pretty accurate. Right. Month, that's two oh, days. Anyway, you're going to open that every morning. Yeah. That's like 30 seconds of your life every day. Okay, so day. that's three minutes a week. That's 12 minutes a month. That's two hours a year. So maybe your life is made out of, you've got 16 oh, hours a day. Let's figure this out. Five, 12 oh, in an hour, 12 in an hour, 144 in 12 hours. He didn't do yeah, let's say 200, 200 five minute chunks. Yeah. That's one of those, right? They're trivial, right? Who cares what my sock drawer looks like? It's like, fair enough, man, but that's your life. The things you repeat every day, the mundane things. I think I could get all those mundane things right. That's the game rules. It's like now all the mundane is in place. Now you can play because all the mundane's in place. And this is actually true. So with children, imagine you want your children to play. Well, play is very fragile neurologically. Any competing motivation or emotion will suppress play. 
So anyway, let's go sit and talk about our day so, with you. And so it's the wrong question. It's like, how can I be the best partner possible? And then you think, well, if I do that, people will just take advantage of me. And that's the non-naive objection, right? Because the naive person saying, well, I'll be good and everyone will treat me right. It's like the cynic says, no, I'll be good and someone will take me out. And then you think, well, what do you do about that objection? Mm -hmm. Risk. I have to ask you about Gulag. Different from the interpretation that a lot of people take of this book. I see him as a kind of hero. Exactly that, yes. Uh, yeah. what, do you, what do you think is the meaning of it all? What's the meaning of life, Jordan Peterson? You, we've defined it many, many times throughout this conversation. It's the adventure along the route, man. And I would say, where's that adventure to be found? In faith? What's the faith? The highest value is love and truth is its handmaiden. That's a statement of faith, right? Because you, you can't tell. You have to act it out to see if it's if it's true. Yeah. And so you can't even find out without, and that's so peculiar. You have to make the commitment a priori. Yeah. It's like a, a marriage. Priority. It's the same thing. It's like, well, is this the person for me? Well, that's the wrong question. How do I find out if this is the person for me? By binding myself to them. Well, maybe the same thing's true of life, right? You bind yourself to it. And the tighter you bind yourself to it, the more you find out what it is. And that's like a radical embrace. And it's, it's a really radical embrace. That's the crucifix symbol. And more than that, because like I said, the, the full passion story isn't death. It isn't even unjust death. It isn't even unjust death and the crucifixion of the innocent, which is really getting pretty bad. It's unjust, torturous, innocent death attendant upon betrayal and tyranny followed by hell. Well, that's a hell of a thing to radically em embrace. It's like, bring it on. I think a lot of people put truth as the highest ideal and um, think they can get to that ideal while living in a place of truth, absent any context, like cynicism and ultimately truth escape. In it. What, what the hell is truth in and of itself, right? Truth is just something that you say about sentences. From life and hiding from life, afraid of life. And it's, a, it's beautifully put that uh, love is the... Uh, I, I just hate this deification. I, I hate this deification of, of truth, right? Um, as if it's as if it's like a property of things and that there's like truth in and of itself or something you just say that, that certain sentences that people say are true like you know is there coffee in the kitchen well it's true if there's coffee in the kitchen right we don't need there's not like some transcendent thing are there atoms well, it's true if there are atoms. It's false if there aren't atoms. It's ideal to reach for, and truth is... It's handmade. I, try, I thought about that for a long time, right? This hierarchy of ideal. And the thing about truth, that bitter truth, let's say, that cynical truth, is it can break the shackles of naivety. And actually, a burnt cynicism is a moral improvement over a blind naivety. Even though one is in some ways positive, but only because it's protected. And the other is bitter and dark. It's still better. But you're not done at that point. You're just barely started. It's like, you're cynical? You're not cynical enough. It's like, how cynical are you? Are you, I'm an Auschwitz prison guard level of cynical? Because you have to be, you have to go down pretty deep. Yeah, no, I am not an Auschwitz prison guard. So. Deep into the weeds before you find that part of you. But you can find it if you want. And then you think, well, I want to stop this. Well, that was the question you posed in some sense. I definitely could be, though. You're obsessed with, say, what happened on these mass scale catastrophes in the communist countries. It's like, well, millions of people participated. So you could have, and maybe you would have enjoyed it. So what part of that is you? And you can find it if you want. Yeah, it's, it's all there. The prisoner, the interrogator, mm -hmm. the, the Judas, uh, <laughs> Pontius Pilate. All of it. All of it. And it's yeah. all of it is inside us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know that that's exactly right, that all of it's inside any given person, because that person has had very different life and experiences. And so and you just have to I mean, look. You can just imagine yourself, right, doing anything. And once you do, maybe eventually. I can imagine myself as a lot of things that I'll never actually You can do. find the love. Jordan, you're an incredible human being. I'm deeply honored you would talk to me. Thank you for being a truth seeker in this world, and thank you for the love. Hey, very thanks for the invitation, man. Seeker. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Jordan Peterson. To support this podcast, just gonna please have check a look out our at sponsors. The comments. Alex is the best interviewer I've ever watched. This is something I've been hoping would happen forever. Finally, what we'll hey Lex. Uh, I can't believe I live in an age where I get to listen to this.
absolutely incredible. I don't know. I think it was pretty underwhelming myself, but maybe it's just because I've heard this stuff a million times before and uh, I'm not taken in by it anymore. I think it's mostly bollocks, useless bollocks. Thank you so much for this conversation. I have my problems with Lex Friedman. Maybe I should do a separate um, a day in the life of Lex. I think I should do a separate review at some point of this. Good morning. This will be pretty funny. Look at this shit. Lex is a special person. Two years ago, that was. I mean, James is invited, but uh, he's always invited, but he's just doing something more useful with his life right now, presumably. Um, okay. Thank you for watching, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. That's an order.